Let's open our Bibles to a very familiar passage, John chapter 14, verses 4 through 6. John chapter 14, verses 4 through 6. <clears throat> I'll be reading from the New International, uh, not the New International, the New King James Version. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the Lord add his blessing to these words and also to Dan's words as he brings us the message this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to start off with a couple stories. This particular study um, is because of a couple things that happened. It was on a Friday morning. And I was praying, Lord, what do you want me to learn today? And he took me to the, the passage that Dan just read. You know, it's a familiar passage, and sometimes we get thinking that we know exactly what it means. Because we've read it so many times. And, you know, God's trying to show us that, you know what, we don't know everything. You know, that no matter how many times you read this, God can use this to take and open up other things. And so later on that day, I, um, I don't know if we were heading down to Amesbury or we were going to Rochester or someplace the next, the next day. So we needed gas in the car. So I took and I stopped by the house, picked up Kathy's car, and then I went and did groceries and, and, put, gas, and, and to put gas in the car. And I always park in one area in the parking spot that in the in the parking lot in you know one vicinity that way there when I come out of the store I don't get confused you know it's just it's easier you know I got too much on my mind if I just park here you know I, I know basically where the car is so I come out of the grocery store and I head over to the car and you know it's a silver Subaru Crosstrek it's a lot of those around but I take and I reach in my pocket and I grab out the key with the, with the fob on it, you know, and I hit the button, and lights don't come on. So I hit it again, and still, and I look in the car, saying, well, is it the right car? My stuff is sitting in the car. So I'm getting frustrated. It's like, I hit it a couple more times, nothing. And I happen to look down, and it has a Toyota key. Yeah. <laughs> I had grabbed the truck key out of my pocket, not that one, you know? And here I am, I'm standing there hitting the stupid button, and I'm the stupid one, not the button, you know? And it's like, and I'm getting frustrated because it's not opening. Until I take some time and I look down and go, oh, put it in, grab that one up, grab the right one out, hit it, and it opened first time, you know? It's, it's like, whew. But... You know, how many times do we do that in our lives? You know, we get frustrated and we're doing the wrong thing. You know, the Toyota key isn't going to open the Subaru. As much as I wanted it to that day, it didn't. And when I finally grabbed the right key, it just opened. You know, it unlocked. You know, we do that in our spiritual lives so many times. That we think we're doing something right, and we've got it all wrong because we aren't using the right tools. We aren't using the tool that Jesus said to, do, to use. We're trying to use our own way to do it. Another story. 
I do a lot of work over in Wolfboro. And there's one place that I frequent there, which is the hardware store. Where I, some of my customers, you know, I never know quite what I'm going to be getting into sometimes. So I have to run to the hardware store and pick up some little thing, you know. And you come off from Main Street, and it's a loop. Depot Road goes in, and it's a one-way. It's a one-way road. And you go in one way, the, the, um, the hardware store is on your left-hand side. There's drive-in parking and you know, kind of diagonal parking type stuff. And then you, when you go out, you back out, you go around, just continue around the loop. But, you know, I have learned from experience that when you go to back out, it's a one-way road, but you look both ways. <laughs> and one of the last ones I saw going the wrong way on the one-way street was a green, dark green vehicle that had an emblem on the side of it that said state police. And I'm thinking to myself, here's the one that's supposed to know the law, supposed to be obeying the law, and he's driving down the wrong way. So how do we apply that to ourselves? We're called to be a member of the remnant church. We know better. We have all the information. We're supposed to be keeping the law, right? And how many times do we go the opposite direction? You know, it's easy for us to look at the state police going the wrong way and going, man. But how about in our own lives? How many times do we go the wrong way? Let's open our Bibles to John, John chapter 14. And some of these things, as, as I was going over them, started to make me realize that God's trying to show me something different about those texts. And I want to start right at the very first First verse of 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? What did Jesus just tell him? He told him where he was going, right? He says, you know, I'm going in my father's house in many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. He had just told them where he was going. And Thomas goes, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And he says, where I'm going, you know. I've been telling you this all along. And he says, I'm also, I also told you how to get there, the way to, the way to get there.
started thinking, maybe God's trying to tell me something here. That maybe I'm not listening right. Maybe there's more to this, this passage than what I thought. Because I thought I knew what it was talking about. But when we put, our place, put ourselves in the place of Thomas, and we start looking and saying, wait a minute, Jesus just told me where he was going, how to get there. First, very first part, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Isn't that the way do we get there? Jesus continues on and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. He just said, and again, he's just telling them, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You're, you know, there's certain traits of a family. Do you think that there, there might have been some certain traits that Jesus was showing of the Father? You know, I remember when I was, I was working for my dad at the time. And again, my, my older brother... He worked for my dad, too, and, and we, we went to this little shop to grab something to eat. We were working in, in Northampton, and it was one of the, another one of those cold days. We just wanted to get in out and get something warm to eat for lunch. And we're sitting there, and there's this old guy in there, and my family is from that area. I mean generations and and this old guy you know the sea coat down the sea coast she's a little bit of a different accent than up here and and i and this old guy looks over at my brother and goes he looks like young evans well this guy didn't know who we were he didn't know that my grandmother was an evans you know but there's a family traits you know, family resemblances, you know? And my brother looks like the Evans side of the family. I do too, but he looks more so like the Evans side of the family. And this old guy m must have known some of either my grandparents, my great-grandparents, or cousins or something, but he said, he, you look like young Evans. You know, those family traits. And Jesus had just told, him, told, told them that if you'd seen him, you'd seen the Father. And Philip's going, Lord, show us the Father, and it's, uh, and it's sufficient for us. Jesus says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me, believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You know, Jesus is just trying to get us to open our eyes. But the one thing that I really want to focus on here, the name of the title is One Way of this, of this study today. And Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that an incredible message of love? That Jesus says, look, there's a way to the Father. And that's only through him. 
We have this incredible message of love. But you know, that message nowadays is offensive to people. You know, there's one thing that kind of bugs me. I tell you, and I'm driving down the road, and I get behind a car, and on one side of the, the bumper, it has one bumper sticker, and on the other one, it has the other. It says, coexist and tolerance. You ever really look at those, those bumper stickers? You ever look at what the symbols are on those that create the letters? So, you know, you have on there, you have Christianity. You have satanic. You have Jewish. You have Muslim. How can all of those coexist and tolerate each other? They can't. So when you say that Jesus is the only way to go to heaven, now that's considered hate speech because you're offending somebody. We have a message of love. And not everyone's going to accept that because they consider it hate speech. But you know what? That doesn't mean that we aren't supposed to be do, uh, presenting that message. But how are we to present it? As a message of love. Not as a message of condemnation to somebody else. But it's such a message of love because you know what? The sacrifice that Jesus gave so we can go to the Father is a message of love. Let's look at the way. Let's go to Acts chapter 22. We're going to start in one. That's Paul speaking. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in he the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus, of Sicilia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of the Father's law, and was zealous towards, toward God as you, as you all are today. I persecuted the what? The way. Who was the way? It's talking about his followers. The way. His followers were called the way. And I just thought that that was such a neat thing that, he, that the followers were called the way, just like we're called Christians. He said, I am the way. And they're calling him the way. They're calling the, the followers the way. I persecuted the way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women as also the high priest bears me witness, and all counsel of the elders, from whom I received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who, who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. And it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul! Why are you persecuting me? And so I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to, him, said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. 
So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And it says, And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to, into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen or heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and calling on the name of, of the Lord. Saul was persecuting the way. The ones that were following Jesus. The ones that were showing other people the way. And Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and speaks to him. And also, he speaks to Ananias. In other parts of, of Acts, it, it goes into it more, a little more deeply. And Ananias is praying, and, and the Lord tells him to go deal with Saul, go talk to Saul. And, you know, Ananias is like, I know the reputation of this guy. He's the one that kills all the, all the people of the way. And he says, no, he's my servant. And you notice when he comes to Saul, he just doesn't come to Saul. He calls him what? Brother. You want to talk about faith. You know, you know, Ananias could be reaching in his pocket and grabbing the wrong key and going, oh, I'm heading that direction. You know? Or he could be like in the swamp, just keep circling. No, I'm not going there. But he doesn't. He goes and he calls Saul, Brother Saul. Wow. Talk about listening to God. Maybe Thomas and Philip weren't hearing correctly, but Ananias was. And Ananias went in the right direction. If Ananias hadn't gone there, maybe things would have been different and Saul wouldn't have come around the way that he did and became Paul. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, and verse 2. Again, it's talking about the same, the same, same instance. And Saul, let's start with verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, I just think it's so neat that, that they were called the way. You know, what if we were, were called the way? Would we be teaching people the way? The way to heaven? It's the same as being called Christians. Are we teaching people to follow Christ? Showing them in our lives. Acts chapter 18, starting with verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, 
born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only the though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to, to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through, gr through grace. And he vigorously refuted the Jews pu publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He was showing them the way. He was showing them Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. We turn, turn the page to Acts 19. In verse 9 it says, But some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. You know, is there people speaking evil of Christianity today? Nothing's new, right? They were speaking evil of the way of the Christians. And in verse... 23 of the same chapter, it says that, and about that time there rose a great commotion about the way. You know, we hear all sorts of stuff about Christianity. Not everyone's going to accept it. Some people are going to fight it. But that doesn't mean that we aren't still to, to present it. Let's go to Acts chapter 24. Paul is before Felix. In verse 14 it says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship <clears throat> the God of our fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. He's saying, you know, that he's following the way says that he's a member of the way, a sect. In verse 22, it says, When Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, you know, Paul explained to him who it was, what the way was. It's a group of people that's following Jesus Christ. They're following the Messiah. says, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysaia, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision in your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or visit him. And after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now, for I, when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. You know, Felix was being pricked to the heart. 
and he chose to fight it. Even though he knew it was right, he chose not to follow it. And he was also hoping for a bribe from, you know, the next verse says that he was hoping money, you know, that Paul would pay him off. But the interesting part that I found in that verse is that he reasoned with him about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Isn't that what we're supposed to be preaching now? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. The three angels' messages. That's what that is. It's about righteousness and righteousness by faith. It's about self-control. It's about not following after your own heart. It's following, following Jesus and the judgment to come. Paul was preaching the three angels' messages to Felix. So, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It's a message. That's the message that we're to give to the world. The salvation is through Jesus Christ. It's a message of love. And if other people interpret that as a, as a hate speech, that's like Felix. Felix was convicted, but he chose to do away, not follow it. But we have an incredible message of love. And Jesus is coming soon. And we have the opportunity to show people the way. The way to heaven. Not everyone will understand it. Be like, be like Thomas. Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. But we can be like faithful Ananias and show people the way. Even, those, even the ones that are persecuting us, we can still show them the way. Jesus says he'll be with us to the end, end of time. Well, time hasn't ended yet. End of the world. We're still here, right? He says that I'm with you no matter what. That I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. And some of us might not make it till the end of the time. End of the world. If God chooses any of us to be part of the 144,000, that's his choice. If he wants us to sleep, that's his choice. He knows what's best for us. But we have the assurance that either we are awake and alive when he comes, or if we're sleeping in the grave, the salvation is sure through Jesus Christ. So let's not worry about any of that sort of stuff. Let's just take and present the gospel to the world. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's only through him and through his saving grace that we're forgiven, that we're justified, that we're made holy because there's nothing that we can do on our own. If we think that we can do it on our own, we're just walking circles in the swamp. And if we're telling people something other than that, we're like the cop going the wrong way on the one-way road. We're supposed to be upholding the law and not going against it. 
And when we try to take it into our own hands, it's like grabbing the wrong, wrong fob and hitting the wrong button to try to unlock the door. Jesus has called us to show the way to a world that is in darkness, and he wants us to show his light to the world. And so when that happens, he says, when it's preached to the whole world, I'm coming to take you home. You know, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house there is many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and I prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where you may, where I am, you may be also. That's the message to a, to a dying world. That we give life and we give hope. Our closing song today is 340. <clears throat> Jesus saves. bow our heads for the benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>